Hi, we're here at the Cold Spring Harbor Genome Stability and Integrity Meeting. I'm Krista Bledsoe, and I'm an editor at Molecular Cell. And I'm here with Sarah Zanders, who has a lab at the Storrs Institute, and they do use an evolution-guided approach to understanding the causes of infertility. So thanks for being here with me today. Yeah, thank you. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the main focuses of your lab? Yeah, so our primary interest is in meiosis, and we want to understand how the process works, and we kind of take an evolutionary approach because there's some really puzzling um, features of meiosis from an evolutionary perspective. Um, namely, the overall process of meiosis is well conserved mm -hmm. throughout eukaryotes. So if you look at meiosis and yeast as we do, it looks pretty similar to meiosis and other um, more fantastic eukaryotes perhaps. Um, so, but the genes that carry out the process of meiosis are not well conserved. Mm -hmm. So they can also be super rapidly evolving. And some of that rapid evolution is even driven by positive selection, which means that for some reason, um, evolution has favored novelty in this very conserved process. So that's kind of a paradox. Why would evolution want change in something that uh, is a conserved process and an essential process in most eukaryotes? Um, so that's kind of the, the foundation of my lab is, is why is that? And the, our favorite hypothesis, it's not one we came up with, but it's our favorite, is that at least some of that rapid evolution is driven by genetic parasites mm -hmm. that are kind of antagonizing the process of meiosis to ensure their transmission through the germline to the next generation. And so what my lab does is to try to identify those parasites in genomes. We try to figure out how the ones we found so far work. And then we try to understand how those parasites might have shaped the overall process of meiosis. Um, we, we focus on um, using a fission yeast model system for our studies. Interesting. I imagine that the yeast model lets you see more generations of evolution. Is that why? Yeah, so we do do some experimental evolution analysis, and the, the yeast really allow us to do that. So we can, you know, go through 10 generations of sexual reproduction in, you know, a very reasonable amount yeah. of time. Whereas, you know, if we were doing a, another system, it would take much longer and be much harder and much more expensive. Um, I also, so the speed is nice, but I also like that um, the genetic tractability of yeast is unparalleled. Yeah. Um, so still, even with you know, CRISPR, the, there's nothing that can compete with, with yeast. And so we um, really need that genetic tractability because um, our selfish genes that we've identified are parasites that we think are antagonizing meiosis. Um, there's many of them. Um, they have complex interactions between them, mm -hmm. and there's also suppressors of them, and these things are spread out throughout the genome. So the genetic complexity of that is, is quite large, and so if we didn't have the super tractability of yeast, it would be quite challenging yeah. to, to figure those things out. Yeah, I can imagine. What led you to working on these selfish genes? So really, um, I, as a grad student, wondering what I was going to do for a postdoc, um, I was at um, a Meiosis Gordon conference, and I saw Harmeet Malik, who became my postdoc advisor, give a talk. And Harmeet was talking about some of these ideas I'm telling you about that, that you know, that perhaps there was something to learn from the rapid evolution of meiotic proteins not just, you know, something to look at and be like, hmm, isn't that strange? Which I felt like was kind of the opinion of, of <laughs> most of the field. It's like everybody appreciated that the process was not well conserved, but it didn't feel at that time to me like anybody was um, looking at that as an avenue to learn more about the process. Mm -hmm. And so Harmeet really opened my eyes to that, that possibility. And so I went to do a postdoc in Harmeet's lab 
after that. Nice. So you're giving a talk here later this week. Can you tell us a little bit about that work? Yeah. So um, the genetic parasites that we study are called meiotic drivers. Mm -hmm. And what these things do is they bias their own transmission into gametes. So there's a bunch of different ways that things can do that. Um, but the net effect is that a heterozygote, so an organism carrying one copy of one of these selfish genes and the alternate allele not being one of these genes, usually heterozygotes like that should transmit the allele to half of the progeny. Mm -hmm. The meiotic drivers that we study transmit the allele to almost all of the progeny. Mm -hmm. So they do that <clears throat> ours, anyway, do that by killing the uh, gametes that inherit the alternate allele. So right now, the, the current, I don't know, dogma, I guess, uh, in the field is that these types of genetic parasites are short-lived um, on evolutionary timescales. So most of the time when folks have identified these things, they find them in a single species and not in closely related species. Or when they do find it um, in a different species, those species are super closely related. Mm -hmm. So it's not like um, the, the genes last for a very long time, but rather that they're, they're born and go extinct in very mm -hmm. short periods of time. Um, but the challenge of that dogma is that it was based on very few actually mapped um, selfish elements. And so the project that I'm going to talk about is a collaboration with uh, Leland Du's lab, mm -hmm. and he's based in Beijing. And what his lab and my lab have found together is that the parasites that we study, um, they're called WTF genes, mm -hmm. that these WTF genes are meiotic drivers, but they're actually very long-lived mm -hmm. um, over evolutionary time. So they've been um, present in fission yeast genomes for over 100 million years, 119-ish million years. Um, and uh, our data suggests that they've been causing meiotic drive over that entire period of time. And so in my talk, um, I'll detail some of the features that we found of the, the evolution of these things that we think have um, promoted their remarkable longevity. Interesting. Are there differences between those and some of the more short-lived examples that have been found previously? So basically, the drivers that have been identified so far in different systems are all quite different. Mm -hmm. They're all you know, unique inventions that have found a way to exploit the process. And so far, there are limited numbers of features that are shared um, between drive systems and different organisms. Um, one unifying theme that doesn't perhaps uh, apply to our system is that some um, drive systems, particularly in um, flies, have a potential common feature in that they uh, exploit chromatin packaging during mm -hmm. gametogenesis. Um, but ours has nothing to do with chromatin packaging during gametogenesis. Interesting. Yeah, that must make them hard to identify. Are there strategies to find them within the genome? Yeah. So. Um, a previous strategy that I, uh, you know, prior to this collaboration with the Do Lab, is to look for genes that are lineage restricted, mm -hmm. <laughs> so found only in one species or a very closely related group of species. Um, so I don't, I don't think that that's perhaps the best approach anymore, um, but it's still a, a possibility. But um, germline expressed genes that are rapidly evolving. Mm -hmm. um, Another common theme that's emerging in, in the field that does apply to the, the, the WTF genes that my lab studies and then also um, other drive genes that have in, uh, been identified in fungi and um, now fruit flies and potentially plants are that the, the genes tend to duplicate. Mm -hmm. There tends to be many copies of these things um, in the genome. So if I was to look, if you gave me a new genome mm -hmm. and asked me to identify potential drivers, I would look for germline expressed multi-copy gene family that is perhaps rapidly evolving, perhaps lineage restricted. I see, thanks. What are the future directions for your work or the next big questions you're hoping to answer? 
Yeah, so we're we're part of the lab is working very hard on trying to understand the mechanism mm -hmm. um, used by the WTF drivers that we study um, to figure out how they actually work, how the proteins they encode mm -hmm. work. Um, so they're kind of interesting but uh, challenging to study proteins. Um, so we'll we'll see see where that goes. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, yeah, thanks for chatting with me today. Yeah, that was really thank you. Nice. Interesting.